I'm David Thompson, and this is the third lecture in the series on dimensionality reduction for the Caltech Big Data uh, Summer School. Um, this lecture is going to be on the topic of feature selection. So in, in previous modules, I talked about local methods for pattern recognition and then described how those methods don't work as well as you move to higher dimensional input spaces. So this is, I guess, the most, the simplest, easiest way to reduce a high dimensional data set to something more manageable, and that's just by taking a subset of, uh, subset of the features. And there are a bunch of ways to do that. Um, we'll investigate many of them here. All right, so the uh, objectives of this module are to be able to first know the, and understand the techniques for combinatorial feature selection um, and to have a couple tools in your toolkit for finding informative features. Um, there are two basic kinds of feature selection methods. There are wrappers and filters, and you should be able to know the difference between them. And you should also be able to know uh, different search strategies for searching for subsets of features. We're going to talk mostly about forward and backwards uh, feature selection. So why are we interested in feature selection in the first place? Well, there are several different reasons why you might want to perform this as a pre-processing operation and go through all the trouble. Um, the first is, of course, um, what I alluded to before, that is that large dimension or high dimensional input spaces can be problematic because they're difficult to sample from. They can introduce uh, lots of challenges for, for local methods and even parametric methods as well, non-local methods. So um, often we like to just reduce the, the raw numbers of dimensions in our input space. Um, Another good thing about feature selection is that it provides a way of revealing key relationships in the data, that is, particular attributes that um, inform your classification or regression decisions, right? So this is useful from an interpretive perspective, right? If I'm trying to understand what's present in a data set, um, knowing the informative features might be in, in, intrinsically or independently useful. Um, finally, uh, our goal of all of this will be to preserve the task-relevant information. So even though we're throwing stuff away, we're hoping that the key relationships will still be captured by the data set um, after we're done. We're just changing the representation uh, to make it more, more comfortable for our, our pattern recognition methods. All right, so every feature selection system involves uh, two different parts. Um, there's an evaluation criterion, that is how you answer the question whether a feature is good or not, or if any given set of features is, is good or not, how it performs. And then, then there's a search routine that you use to explore the space of different feature combinations, and we'll talk about each of those in turn. Um, we're going to start by discussing the evaluation criteria that you use. So given some subset of features, how do I score that subset um, with respect to my pattern recognition strategy task? Okay, and there are two basic different ways of, of doing that. Uh, there are wrapper evaluations and filter evaluation strategies. So um, the, the wrapper strategies, um, this is a general class of, um, of uh, feature selection routines that use, the, they, they sort of envelop whatever core pattern recognition engine you're using. So say I'm using a k-nearest neighbor approach. Uh, the wrapper would simply um, push the, the candidate set of features through that k-nearest neighbor and evaluate the performance with respect to the task using whatever task relevant metric um, we've chosen for our basic pattern recognition engine. In this case, it could be cross-validation error, for example, on held out data points. Um, so we get our cross-validation error for a particular feature candidate set and can then use that as a score to compare um, as we change the, the subset of features that we use. So typically this amounts to an iterative approach where we try different candidate feature subsets, um, do the entire training and testing procedure with all of the leave one out cross validation and all of the unbiased risk estimation that's necessary to do uh, real pattern recognition, and then we evaluate our performance with those subsets and, and iterate again, um, improving our set of, of candidate attributes to use until we're finally satisfied with our performance. And either we've reduced the, the set of, subs, the set of, of attributes sufficiently Right, to the point where we could, it's now tractable, or um, we start to see um, some, uh, a fall off in our performance. That is, we've, we've um, included too many features and we're starting to hit the curse of dimensionality again. So that's the way a, a wrapper works. Uh, filters, on the other hand, uh, operate as a pure pre-processing step. So they have some measure of performance that's totally different from your pattern recognition performance, right? It might be some measure of informativeness with respect to class labels uh, by some, measured by some other model. And by applying that in advance, you can um, do the, the iterative juggle and figure out what the, the optimal subset of attributes is before you even bring it to your, your k-nearest neighbor's classification or whatever classification method you're planning on using ultimately uh, to solve the problem. So 
this is um, basically using the, the intrinsic properties of the data or critically some other model than the, the pattern recognition engine um, for the, that describes performance on the task. All right, so of these two, I'll talk about error, or I'll talk about error evaluation for wrappers first. Um, like I mentioned, wrappers um, are a typical um, error analysis with a, a wrapper-based approach would be to look at your performance on held out data, leave one out cross-validation. And the advantage of the wrapper method is that it gives you an accurate indicator of performance on your, your actual task. So you'll know that the, the subset you select is actually the best performer um, at the, the ultimate pattern recognition task you, you intend to solve. Um, however, there are some disadvantages to the wrapper method too. Uh, one major disadvantage is the computational complexity. And this is pr uh, especially true if your, your pattern recognition method is really inefficient or computationally expensive. If your training and test procedure involves weeks of training on a supercomputer cluster, you might not be able to try with many combinations of attributes. It might just not be feasible uh, to, from a, a time and resource perspective to do that training, at which point wrappers become uh, less desirable. Um, also, there's this issue of specificity. So it could be that the, uh, because these are very finely tuned to the particular pattern recognition method you're using, um, it, it could be that they don't reveal anything intrinsic about the data itself, but are, you're, you're simply adjusting the attributes according to, to the, the properties of your, your pattern recognition engine rather than, than the data itself. So um, they're very specific is another way of saying that. And if you change the underlying classifier, you might need to pick a new set of attributes, right, which would involve a, a new um, uh, iterative procedure to do that. So, so wrappers um, can be very accurate, but they also come with these important disadvantages. So um, moving now to filters. So um, if you instead use a filter or pre-processing approach, um, there are all sorts of different criteria, sort of generic criteria that you can use um, to judge whether an attribute or a set of attributes um, gives you information about the target class label or um, ordinate for a regression problem. And these could be the KS test, a traditional uh, KS test. Uh, the Pearson correlation score is, is often used. So you'd simply find um, a, a subset of features with a, a good Pearson correlation. Uh, the mutual information is a method, it's a, um, basically a measure from information theory that measures the amount of bits of information that uh, some subset of features provides about your, your class label. Um, or you could use the Fisher score. All of these are, are, are valid filter criteria that you could apply that are sort of independent of your classification model. Um, and advantages to using a filter approach is um, basically computational. When you can't apply the full pattern recognition uh, method in its entirety on, the, on multiple runs of, of, through the data, then um, you can apply this as a pre-processing step and reduce the, the number of attributes at the, at the outset, right? Which, which saves you from the, the curse of dimensionality. Um, the disadvantage, of course, is that you're sort of positing some new measure of performance than diff that's different from what you ultimately want to evaluate. So it implies some new uh, potentially redundant model. Right, so which raises the question, why are we going through all this extra work of building a whole new model for our data, a whole new performance metric, when really what we're interested in is our k-nearest neighbor classification? I want to talk about one other specific filter ap approach based on the conditional mutual information because this is sort of emblematic of, of a bunch of, of useful filtering criteria from information theory and because it, it tends to perform pretty well. Um, so this is Fleury uh, et al. in Journal of Machine Learning Research 2004. But again, like I said, it's reminiscent of lots of, of um, information theoretic measures of, of performance that are used in, in different filtering uh, approaches to feature selection. So here we have a score that's defined on the left-hand side of the equation. It's called the conditional mutual information, which basically measures the amount of new information that some new attribute, A sub i, provides about the class label Y, uh, given the, the data that we've, or the, given the attributes already in the set, that is the, the attribute set A. Um, and this is defined uh, as it follows on the, the right side. So we're actually looking at two different entropies. The entropy is here written uh, using capital H, and the entropy describes, uh, it, it's a measure of uncertainty about a distribution. So we're measuring the uncertainty about the distribution of class labels Y, uh, given our, our current set A of, of attributes, and then uh, s subtracting the, the entropy of, of Y, given the, the joint um, rather the, the uh, values of the candidate feature and, and our attributes set together. Right. And you can expand the, the conditional entropy in the following way. 
Um, it's th this, these are, again, just straight-up definitions uh, from the information theory literature. Um, it, and it, it gives us it, it basically the, the number of bits of new information that this uh, candidate feature will provide uh, with respect to our class label. So this is a, a particularly useful and high-performing uh, filter function that doesn't it, uh, presume any knowledge of the ultimate classification uh, method that you're going to use. Of course, it requires that you're able to estimate the probability densities. So it does require some kind of probability modeling there. But provided you can do that, uh, then this is a fairly straightforward approach to use. Okay, so now that I've talked about different uh, evaluation criteria, I want to describe the search routine that you use for exploring different subsets of attributes, different subsets of features. Um, probably the most common one is called the greedy forward search. And um, this is, you can think of this like a salad bar, where you start off with an empty plate and just add things one at a time according to whatever looks best. So uh, formally speaking, you start with an empty feature set. This is A, um, starts as the null set, which is A is our set of attributes here. And um, we iterate adding at each step the, the best performing feature to our data set. So this, this involves a bunch of nested loops. While our performance is still improving, we look through all of the candidate features that we have remaining. That is, all the items on the solid bar. Um, we add, we, we try adding that candidate uh, feature to our data set, and then evaluate our performance using our performance criterion that, um, that I mentioned before, either a wrapper or a filter method. Um, and based on that, we figure out which is our best overall feature to add to the data set, and we append it to our, our feature set, and then continue iterating, looking for the, the next best feature to add, given the one that we've, we've already established. So um, this, again, uh, continues as long as we want to, um, until either performance starts to suffer, or we start encountering the, the curse of dimensionality. We've grown our, our attribute set too high. Um, and the, it's called the greedy method because, of course, at, at each step we're trying to maximize our performance gain. So it's not always optimal. And in particular, if there are pairs of features that are together very informative but independently not that informative, we're not going to catch that relationship here because we're at, just adding the next best feature um, at every iteration. That said, uh, greedy forward search usually works pretty well for most uh, practical problems, and it's a good place to start. It also has the advantage that it's pretty computationally uh, efficient because you're starting with very few attributes, right? So those early computations that you do, um, it, it will be pretty cheap to perform because um, the, the attribute factor is fairly low. You're working with a very low dimensional problem, right? Um, and you can carry that on for as long as you want. So that's one example of a simple search strategy. Here's another search strategy you might want to use. Um, the, obviously, if we were starting with forward search, the uh, converse of that would be a backwards elimination, where we start with a full set of features, and then um, at each step, we figure out which one we want to eliminate in order to best improve performance. Um, so um, again, this, this starts off with, uh, you can see on the, the, the formal uh, uh, algorithm there on the, the left side, we're starting off with features one through uh, A sub N, right? So we start off the full set and then um, evaluate one candidate at a time, eliminating it, evaluating our, say, our cross-validation error or our wrapper metric, and then removing it from the data set. Now, um, this has some disadvantages because um, obviously we are susceptible to the, immediately susceptible to the curse of dimensionality. So um, it is impractical for many circumstances where we'll just fail utterly uh, for the, uh, the full set of features, right? And it will be impossible to, to get any sort of meaningful performance score out of that. Um, we'll also incur all the computational cost of working with the full attribute set. So, uh, so that's a major disadvantage of backwards elimination. But if you can do it, if you can hack it, um, backwards elimination can be good because it um, actually lets you capture relationships between pairs of, of features that you might miss if you're just adding one, um, one feature at a time from an empty set. So they, they each have their own advantages depending on, on the computational properties of your, your algorithm and the data set. Okay, I also want to briefly touch on some options for non-greedy search. There are, here are just a few, but there are lots more. Um, people have proposed simulated annealing approaches. You can think of simulated annealing as a stochastic search, where you search randomly throughout the data set and perturb your candidate list um, according to some temperature term that decreases over time. So uh, very early on, you're going to be searching wildly, right, and jumping through uh, wildly differing can uh, candidate sets of attributes. And then as the temperature reduces, um, you'll 
you'll settle into some local maximum, right, which has a good uh, combination of features. And you can think of this as a, a non-greedy search approach. People have proposed branch and bound uh, search algorithm, algorithms as well as genetic algorithms for, for feature selection too. So it's it, more generally just any uh, non-convex combinatorial optimization uh, engine is uh, a candidate for some sort of uh, a feature selection algorithm. Uh, and there are lots of non-greedy methods to, to consider. Okay, so um, in summary, uh, every feature selection algorithm has a couple parts. It has an evaluation criterion, and we've talked about wrapper and filter evaluation methods. And it also has a search strategy, and we've talked about uh, greedy forward and greedy backwards elimination as uh, both different searches that, that you can try. Um, so this gives us a, a lot of options to choose from for our feature selection strategies. Uh, in the next module, we'll be talking about some other methods for um, dimensionality reduction that will actually use the full set of features but still have the end desired result of reducing the total dimensionality of the data set.